Hello, Internet. Gino, that Pinguino Grieco, here again with another episode of Deep Listens. I am joined by uh, magical Billy Rothert and by Guilds of Ravnica, Devin DeFrancesco. <laughs> it's good to be back. It's been a while for me. Thanks for having me on, Gino, again. Uh, excited to talk about this this topic. It's one that I sort of picked out for this bonus episode. So we are going to be discussing today D and D guilds of magic, uh, guilds of Ravnica. Sorry, guilds of magic, guilds of magic, guilds of Ravnica, Ravnica D and D. There are Ravnica? so many more guilds in magic than there are in this in this set. Uh, so yeah, specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, the. Dungeons and Dragons Magic the Gathering crossover book that's been announced, The Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, just to be clear. Yes. So, Billy, why don't you explain what this is? Sure. Um, so, as some of the listeners may know, if they've um, you know been following the show for a long time, we did a podcast way back when, of when I uh, was just starting a D&D campaign. This was probably in November of 2016. It was a really long time ago. And that was the sort of birth of my D&D experience. And right around the same time, I was playing a lot of Magic. As you should. Those are, those are, my, two, those are my two big downtime activities, was Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. Well, as some of you also know, Wizards of, Wizards of the Coast also, you know, is the current owner and controlling body of Dungeons and & Dragons. And we're currently in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, and um, there have been, you know, lots of expansion books released. One of these books was just released late July, sorry, not, not released, announced. It was just announced late July 2018, and... This book is the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, a guide for how to um, take elements of the Return to Ravnica plane and build a and d campaign around them. And I lost my shit. I was like, this is amazing. Two of the things that I've been spending most of my time on recently, now I can do in one setting. It's awesome. Yes. And so we're going to get a lot of mixing. The peanut butter is going with the chocolate. So, as some of our listeners may be aware, I'd be jumping the gun. Um, this is not the first time they've released some sort of like, oh, this is how you can do Zendikar in D anD. d They have. Uh, this ha- how is this going to be different? No, there, there have, there have been things that um, they're called plane shift. Right, right, right. So there have I think the one that I'm most uh, familiar with is the Zendikar one. There, there was some content release that said, "Hey, if you if you like some elements of Zendikar, here's how they would best map into the D and D setting." And um, I believe a lot of that stuff got released alongside a um, an expansion called Elemental Evil. I might be getting that mixed up a little bit, but um, there were there were tons of um, new spells and abilities that got released. And I think they did it in conjunction with some, gu- with some kind of guide on how to um, uh, adapt some things from the, from the Zendikar plane into, into magic as Zendikar is also a very, you know, ele- elemental imbalance shift kind of, kind of plane. Yeah. It's, it's um, adventure world. So it really lines up well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Zendikar is, would, would be a fantastic plane, to have any kind of D and D story on, and I think uh, some of the other crowd favorites, um, uh, Ravnica is certainly one of them. Now, you two have played D and D. Sorry, I uh, have played Magic a lot longer than I have, and know just in general more about the game. If you had to pick some of the top planes of existence, people might want to host a D and D campaign in. What would you guys thought as like some of your top? Planes of existence. Uh, Ravnica with a bullet is probably number one because it is such a political realm. It's got a bunch of different, you know, guilds to go with. So they picked the one of the best ones right off the bat, which is good. Devin, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, definitely. Um, I just wanted to quickly state, um, just for the purpose, I, my first thing that came to mind was Innistrad. Um, which is kind of like the gothic horror plane for magic. 
But just uh, just for, for, to let our listeners know, um, there are plane shift additions for Zendikar, Innistrad, Kaladesh, Amonkhet, and Ixalan, and uh, Dominaria. Oh wow, they they've been really churning them out. Yeah, pretty much. I think since the Zendikar one, they've been like, oh, people like this. But it is my understanding this thing for Ravnica is going to be. It's going to be a little bit different. Yeah, it's, it sounds to me. It sounds like it, we don't really need too many details. It looked like it was going to be a lot more, um, a lot more detailed. This uh, is going to behave um, closer to like a D and D module, from what I understand. Um, they're going to be giving dungeon masters guides on how to build a long-term campaign set in the Ravnica setting, as opposed to, um, hey, if you really like Innistrad, here are some things that map pretty well, or some slight tweaks you could do to make it Innistrad. Um, yeah. Right the, now, the, the, the plane ahead. shift things are basically just like a uh, like a couple pages of like PDF. Well, this is like a full book, correct? Yeah, this is going to be a full book. Um, the one that I so like a, a lot of times when they do one of these plane shift things, they'll they they might drop in like you know, like a page or two of like oh here's how you can make a different race. Like one example, I think they they gave like a stat block for what like a core would be from Zendikar. Like that'd be a that that'd be a good example of what they would do in like one of those old plane shift things and just some other quick notes on how to flavor the world like an um, MTG plane. But this book is going to be substantially different. This book is going to have lots more guidance, lots more guidelines. And this is going to be the first time um, Wizards has done a substantial crossover like this between Magic and D&D. So um, one of the things that I was thinking about, and I kind of want to get your y'all's opinion on, is... What kind of things needs to be considered most when you bring a Magic the Gathering world set into a tabletop RPG element? Of then, let me try to narrow this question down a little bit more. Um, there are certain like defining factors of different sets of Magic, right? Yes, M- Mirrodin, for example, is a heavy artifact. I think, right? Isn't that like their whole thing? Yeah, it's an artifact world. And so is Kaladesh, is heavy heavy artifact. Yeah. Um, uh, Ravnica, obviously, we know has these guilds. Um, Zendikar has this elemental adventure imbalance, and Innistrad's dark and gothic-y. What kind of things are most important to you two as MTG players that you would want to see reflected well in a D&D setting? Um, I think some crucial things is to kind of... Um, the Magic actually has, like, some cards that are for, like, Soul of X plane, and kind of the idea of, like, you really want to get the soul of what it is that players love about the plane. So, I mean, for something like Ravnica, you wouldn't, you want it to be a, a city world with, you know, politics and underhand deals and, um, you know, all sorts of things of that nature. But, you know, something like Innistrad, you'd want, you know, all the monsters. You'd, you'd really want whatever it is that players that like, have most loved and enjoyed and like feel the strongest connection to to really be boiled down like to the essence such that it can be you know translated into D speak yeah and i think that you also some of the spells i think make you know for really good flavorful additions so some of the spells that you can get in these different settings i think makes sense you could also get some of the world involved in there Though I don't think that it's essential that you, you know, get the whole storyline of a given set involved. Um, but I think it, it definitely adds something when you can have some of the initial characters. And one thing that I I don't know how you would do it, but getting the Planeswalkers involved could be interesting. Like some of the major story players. I think my, my only concern with that would be that I would definitely want the players to have a pretty limited role. Like, you, you would definitely want the players to be able to be, like, the biggest... Like, it, it, you often in D&D, you're kind of like an outsider to the world. It, but Planeswalkers are basically, like, the players of Magic. Yeah. They're, they're pretty analogous to what D&D camp, a campaign party is. A, a, a party is usually like an outsider that comes into a situation and 
make some kind of impact on the scenario, which is pretty much exactly what Planeswalkers do in Magic. Yeah, I think just if they're, you know, an element of the story that you can bring in, but that does not consume the entire story, I think it would be interesting. You know, like yeah, if, I agree. They, if they made it such that, um, like, for example, Nicole Bolas can show up, but he's not, you know, the entire focus of the story. He's a character you can bring in if you so choose. I guess they could definitely be like an adversary. Adversary would definitely work pretty easily. And this brings me to sort of like three areas where I think from a D&D perspective, the influence of planeswalkers or major figures would fit really well. So from a D&D perspective and specifically a DM's perspective, one of the nicest things to have as a dungeon master is a character that can just come in for a second and um, provide some plot guidance and then step back. Um, a lot of times DMs will use a character here or there that will um, not necessarily control the story, but but just provide some options or some narrative um, guidance somewhere. And the fact that we have Planeswalkers as already these like very well-established, well-known figures, any DM, even if they're not that familiar with Magic the Gathering, can just look up Jace and get a you know decent idea of what Jace is all about, or look up Chandra and get a decent idea of what Chandra's all about. Um, it yeah, doesn't take that much to know a great ready-made character. Exactly, and I think that part of the fun, if you're going to the trouble of actually buying a kind of D&D expansion that pulls Magic in, Part of it is the fun of kind of role-playing and making fan fiction. And I feel like if you have some established characters that you can get involved in here, uh, you it would make it a little bit easier. Now, I don't think you have to do it for the players. Like, players will make their Jaces date their Vraskas in their storylines. <laughs> they will do it. Oh, my? Oh, yeah. They will make Jace and his, his sinewy, weak boy body... That, that he's training up in Ixalan, I'm sure someone has made the storyline where, you know, he and, and Vraska fall in love and you have to help in some sort of uh, some sort of hijinky love letter situation. However... I, 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 I assume you're aware that that's, like, just... You're, you're just, like, a hair's breadth away from, like, the actual canon of what happened in Ixalan. I know. I know I am. And I'm saying <laughs> that a hair's breadth away is not how fan fiction works. <laughs> Fan fiction does not work in subtlety. It does not work in degrees. <laughs> they need to smooch, and then they, I don't know. Bone. If, I don't know if gorgons can bone, but if they can, they do bone. And then maybe even there's a kid. Who knows? <laughs> but I'm saying that there should be pre-made characters where Jace's, you know, obviously, clearly, he's romanced so many, and he has to have those options. Because everyone wants to be Jace for some reason. It, if there isn't, like, if, if your D and D campaign for um, Ravnica doesn't is it like a hundred years after the events of the current Gay Watch and doesn't include like a Jace and uh, Vraska like love child that's like grown up now, like I don't know what you're doing wrong. Like exactly. I, don't, I don't know what you're, you're like. <laughs> Mommy, so... why does no one like me? Well. <laughs> Turning everyone into stone doesn't because you have help, psychic silly. powers and you're a half snake person. <laughs> well, when you look at people, you turn them to stone, and also you've got weak little arms. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I think you probably want those NPC kind of not MP, yeah I guess those NPCs available. I don't think you'd want necessarily to have rules for people to role play as planeswalkers. Though I think as you keep getting these different expansions, you can conceivably start making rolling characters that are planeswalkers and using these rule sets for all these different worlds to kind of make world hopping adventures, which sounds really compelling to me. Like a lot of these magic worlds are really interesting and have depth, but the story is only what, like 200, 400, maybe 600 cards per locale at a time. Right. I mean, speaking specifically about planeswalkers, I think there, for me, there was, two other main areas where they could show up and be beneficial and useful. And one was like, like we mentioned earlier as like adversarial. And the fact that a bad guy could like, if they wanted to get up and leave and you have to chase them somewhere else into a whole new realm, that seems really cool. And show up anywhere. 
Yeah, and show up anywhere. A bad guy could just show up from anywhere. And not so in some cases, that's weak storytelling, right? Because if a bad guy just pops up out of nowhere um, in a regular D&D setting, you'd be like, all right, DM, like, where was the lead up for this? Like, how, like, you can't just teleport someone into the room. But no, in D&D realm, that's what planeswalkers do. They show up and they either fuck things up really bad or they fix everything. <laughs> Yeah. So that's kind of Planeswalker's whole deal. They're great at being adversaries in this in this respect. They are perfect Deus Ex Machina. 100%. Nicole Bolas is just Deus Ex Machina, the character. Yeah, and uh, who else? Soren's probably like that too. He, I don't think he was in Ravnica, but Soren would be a great example of this half good guy, half bad guy. Sometimes I'm here to 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 be your friend and guide you. Sometimes I'm here to just be a badass vampire. Exactly. Bolas yeah, is like. Fiora... Kiora also has some of that of, yeah. like, she kind of does her own thing. She isn't, like, evil like Bolas is. She's mm -hmm. just more of, like, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna, I, I need that trident there, so I'm, it's mine, thanks. Somebody like Obnixilis, great, just pure malice bad guy. You know, yeah. awesome example. You get all these, uh, all these characters, and each of them have their own little quirks. Isn't that Domri is technically a bad guy? Domri's I just a I have no guy. idea. He's just I think a he's bad guy. <laughs> not gruel than die? <laughs> yeah, sure. He just kind of well, hangs out and does wild boy stuff. The third thing about Planeswalkers that I thought would be really, really nice, and this will sort of tie into the next segment that I wanted to ask you guys about. More of a more of a game segment, but we'll transition on this note. Um, very frequently in Dungeons and Dragons, there will be some kind of spell or ability that has a name attached to it, and you know, it'll be some something like you know, Mordenkainen's Magnificent Mansion, or Agonazar's Scorcher or something. Or, or Jaya's Inflating Inferno. Yeah. <laughs> or Snillic's Snowball Swarm. You know, there's a bunch of... Or Melf's Minute Meteors. There's a bunch of little, like, spells that have a person's name on it. Karn's Temporal Sundering. <laughs> I could very easily see them throwing in a couple of spells for flavoring that say, like, Jace's something. Chandra's Fire Hot Death. Ral Zarek's Lightning Bolt. <laughs> Ral Zarex flip some coins. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Gideon's BDSM charm spell. Domri oh Rods take it to the octagon. <laughs> Urza's rage. Urza's ruinous blast. So, uh, bouncing off that, I wanted to play just a quick little uh, game. Because we've been talking about D&D &D and magic getting together, but there may already be a lot of overlap already so what i want to do this is for both of you okay we'll throw out i'm going to just describe some ability some kind of effect ability spell whatever i'm just going to describe it and i want you two to tell me if this effect comes from D, &D comes from ravnica or maybe already exists in both so it's an effect you're not just naming a spell yeah, I'm not. I'm not just naming a spell. I'm gonna like describe its rules text. I, I, now I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to like, uh, like make some of the wording ambiguous. Like for example, the word bonus action is never going to show up on a Magic the Gathering card. The words like plus X plus X aren't going to show up on a D and D like effect. So I'm gonna kind of make the wording ambiguous. But I think once we get a couple, you know, a couple cards or a couple spells, and you'll see, you'll see what I mean. So, uh, here is the uh, here is the first uh, first first question. Um, anytime this creature deals damage, it gets stronger. I mean, go, Devin. I, I it has to be in both. Yeah, that Great. has to be both. Okay, you are correct. There is a, a card there are called vampires that do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this is this is specifically. I, I, I just to add a caveat. I'm only going to be looking at instants, sorcerers, and enchantments. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily creatures. So you said each time this creature deals damage, it gets stronger. So uh, it's yeah. an it's an enchantment that makes something grow when it deals damage. Yes. That effect is in both, but what is the card? All right, so the card is uh, Gleam of Battle. Whenever a creature you control attacks, put a 1-1 counter on it. That effect doesn't actually exist 
in MTG or uh, in D and D. Really? There is something kind of close to it. It's called Hunter's Mark, where if you land with an attack, you deal a little bit more damage, but it's not actually a permanent buff. Okay. Like temporary yeah. damage. Subtle difference. But so, that's, a that's, subtle, that's a subtle difference. That's a oh, deep new cut. barbarian ability. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, all right. Deep cut. Yeah. All right, so... So this... Um, this effect says this creature gets stronger and uh, maybe can fly. That is definitely... Oh, I actually know what card that is. Go ahead, Devin, you guess. Well, I mean, I know it's in magic. I I feel like flying and getting stronger is probably not paired together in D&D. I, I could be wrong, of course, but I'm, I'm just going to go that's just a magic effect. That is a... I don't know the name of the card off the top of my head. It's a red enchantment with a blue activation cost. It gives You're right. It's a creature plus two plus two, and then you can activate it to give it flying? Yes, that is Pursuit Volt of Flight. Jump? Pursuit of Flight. Pursuit of Flight. Yeah, that weird enchantment with like a lightning flying lizard thing on it. Got there. Got there. It took it took, took a little bit of work, but we, we definitely got there. We definitely got there. Um, all right, so, um, this, this effect, oh, hold on, that one, I had two copies for that one, okay, (laughs) um, all right, this effect says, simultaneously, the creature moves faster Attacks twice and is harder to kill. Gina, I think you should go first. Um, this is a magic effect, but hmm, th- this card exists in magic. I'm not sure if it's a Ravnica card. Um, that gives haste, double strike, and buffs toughness. That doesn't sound like a Ravnica card off the top of my head. This is going to be a hard one. We're getting... So this is specifically three effects in one ability or one card. Move faster, attack twice, grants more endurance. Of some, to of me, that makes it harder, sounds, harder, harder to kill. There might be something that is more or less that in Magic, but I'm guessing the ability that you're reading is a D&D effect. I could be wrong, though. Yeah, I, I'm going to... I remember a lot of cards. So those are three things that make a lot of sense if it's a magic effect. I don't know that it makes as much sense. It might make sense in D&D context as well. Um, But I know a lot of cards in Ravnica, like in sets that were set on Ravnica, and I don't remember any of them giving haste, double strike, and only a toughness boost. Um, So I'm going to say that this is not a magic card. Correct. This is a D and D effect, but it's Got very there. it's very close to a magic card. Uh, Boros Charm is pretty close to this. Yeah, but it doesn't do all of them at once. It doesn't do all of them at once. It does. So uh, the the uh, the effect that I was going for in Magic: The Gathering was the haste spell. The haste spell reads that uh, you can uh, you your, your movement is doubled. You can attack two times. Essentially, you get another attack. Um, on that turn, and it grants plus two to your armor class. The Boros Charm says you gain indestructible, so there's the durability. You gain double strike, but Boros Charm deals direct damage where haste does not in in D and D. All right, you almost tricked Whew. me on that one. Almost. Yeah, I know, I know that 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 was that was kind of a hard one. That was kind of a hard Though, one. Though there is a card called Psychotic Fury in Dissension. That gives a creature double strike. So that was the card that I thought it might have been, but then I remembered it does not buff anything else. It gives double strike and draw a card. All right, here is an effect, another effect. This one's the, the, this is probably a little a little bit easier. Okay. Okay. So this creature is bestowed with. Three more offense and three more defense. Is 
that it? Yeah, that's it. Huh. There's got to be a, a magic card that does that. There is, but yeah. is it in Ravnica? I think there's a giant growth effect in Ravnica. Pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty know? sure that there's an effect that gives plus three, plus three. It's not. I'm, I don't think it's giant growth, but I'm pretty sure at least one of the instants or sorceries in Ravnica does plus three, plus three. Or, or auras. There's got to be something that just gives plus three, plus three. Yeah, it's got to exist. Mm-hmm. Well, the card was giant growth. Oh, okay. So That's good. Got it. Squeaked in. Uh, but the parallel ability that I was thinking of was a ability that's literally called Enlarge. <laughs> Embiggen. There is a spell in, ma- uh, in D&D that's just called Enlarge. <laughs> And it makes people get huge. And so when I, when I, I'm sorry, it makes a player increase by one size. So they like take up more space and they, 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 they actually do end up dealing more, more damage um, when they do their attacks and stuff, but it wasn't one to one. So this is definitely a magic card, not a D and D effect. Okay. All right. Let's here's rapid one. Fire these. Let's go. Yeah. Rap, rapid fire. Um, this spell or ability creates four little creatures. MTG. Uh huh. Four. It makes four creatures. Four little creatures. Specifically four. I'm gonna say D and D. I think there are many spells that make three, but I don't think there's any from Ravnica that make four. Both. Damn. There is both. There is a sorcery. Goblin Rally put four one one red goblin creature tokens onto the battlefield and conjure minor elementals. In D and D, summons four oh, yeah. uh, like methods, little methods. Forgot cool. about that. That's all the a good one. Modes. All right, lightning round, lightning round. Okay, this effect deals damage and says you can't gain life for a, for a short duration. That is a magic Skullcrack. card. It is Skullcrack. It might be both. It is both. It is both. There is a cantrip called Chill Touch that does the same thing. Deals some damage. Says you can't gain life. Neat. All right, one more right. last That's a deep cut. I didn't. I sure didn't play that card. That's real bad. Yeah, one more last last one. Then we're done. Uh, this effect or ability turns you into another creature and gives you uh, a damage boost. Both. And gives you a damage boost. It clones and does a damage boost. Turns you into a different creature and gives you a damage boost. And I'll I'll even add this. And uh, hold on, let me let me just double check the one of the rules text here. Hold on, this could even be better. This could even be better. Hold on, hold on. Make you a frog lizard? Nope. But hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Does that be um, What's that card called? Pong- um, it's not Pongify. It's the Pongify other one. makes you a monkey. Uh, rapid hybridization makes you yeah, a frog lizard. All right. Okay. All right. I got this. I double checked rules text. Okay. So this cre- this effect. Right. This is the last one. Last round. This effect turns you into a different kind of creature, gives you a damage boost, and if you do this effect harder, you can target more than one target for this thing oh okay uh this is this is both well i damage boost is where i'm con- i was a little confused because depending on what you started as you might not end up as strong as that's true true it. true um so this is dragon shift I think yeah yeah got there <laughs> and then in in, in, in D, is it like uh you can use a higher level spell so that's that. That's what I wanted to sort of add as a, a layer to make this easier. Um, polymorph is what I was going for in D and D, but polymorph doesn't. Um, polymorph is what I was going for in D and D, but polymorph doesn't necessarily give you a damage boost. It can, uh, but you can't. You specifically can't target more creatures if you cast polymorph at a higher level. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah well, that was that good. was cool. Is there not like a mass polymorph? Uh, I think there's true polymorph, and that can be kicked up by doing, um, I think casting that at a higher level, you can make the effect last longer. I'm not 100% sure, but okay, that's it. Well, 
it's nice that there will be some nice effects. I'm looking forward to Putrefy being in uh, D&D, Mortify, <laughs> all the good ones. The, there is a mass polymorph in D&D. Oh, there is? Yeah, There's you one transform in magic up to ten creatures of your choice wow. that you can see within range, blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God. So, now that we're in Ravnica, like the setting is specifically Ravnica, which of the guilds are you most interested in playing as or playing with? So to, just for those who don't know, the ten guilds are Slesnia, which is kind of a hippie tree guild. Like they're they're communists pretty much. They're, they're communists that love the trees. Um, there is Azorius, the Azorius. Um, they are rules lawyers. They are basically all sorts of uh, judges and police. They are cops. Um, then there's the Orzov. They are kind of a corrupt religious organization. They are made up of ghosts and, like, spirits. Think of, like, Roman church back when they were taking um, tithings and stuff like that. Um, there is the Boros. They are kind of a military force and also peacekeeping, but they are a little bit more fervent. Think Think more military than uh, Department of Justice. Right. And then there is uh, the Is It. They are a guild that is kind of all about experimentation. They are mad scientists. They're the Simic. They are also mad scientists, but more biology than chemistry. There is the Demir. They are kind of a spy shadowy guild that mm -hmm. infiltrates places and, and does assassinations and stuff. There are the Golgari, which are kind of these uh, zombie and plant people. They are kind of your trash people of, of the world. They're made up almost entirely by dead and dying things. Um, there's the Gruul, which are this guild made up of kind of big bruisers. They beat people up. Very um, nature-based. Nature-based. They, they like things the way it used to be. And the way it used to be is with fists. Um, and then there's the Rakdos, the fun-loving uh, anarchists, I guess. Fun-loving sadists and anarchists. But they're fun-loving, so they, you know, they'll kill you, but it'll be like throwing knives at you while you're spinning on a wheel or something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the one thing that's important about this guild system that Ravnica has is it's actually going to change the way characters are made in D&D. This is one of the things that was attractive to me the most about this set. So when when a person is making a D and D character, right? You know, obviously you roll stats, you pick your you know race and class and stuff, but you also pick this thing called a background. In general, making a D and D character is in like five steps: roll your stats, pick your background, pick your race, pick your class, set your abilities and stuff, right? And this book, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, is going to change one of those things. Like, hey, instead of your background, like we have in regular Magic the Gathering, you're going to pick which of these ten guilds you're a part of. And that's going to be the lens through which you sort of see the world of D&D that your DM presents to you. So how do you guys feel about having a guild being part of your character creation? I like it a lot. I think it I think it lets players have a really easy time understanding beforehand some of the things that their characters want because a difficult thing about any kind of new player or even an experienced player making a new a new character is hmm what are my character's motivations what does my character want what do they fear what are some of my character's core core belief structures and where a background in D D kind of gives you these like ideals and bonds and traits and flaws they kind of give you some stuff but they're more loose these are much more well defined and fleshed out you know what rakdos is all about you know what the boros are all about you know what Simic is all about. You, so this allows people to have a little bit better framework within which to build their characters because so much of it is kind of already designed for you, but not in a bad way that's limiting, in a cool, flavorful way that makes for really good interactions with other players and other factions. Yeah, and one thing, Devin, what do you think of, in terms of, what do you think these setups will do to how characters are kind of rolled? Because each of these guilds are in opposition. Like, well, they're not always in opposition. Sometimes they cooperate. Sometimes they don't. But 
it, it might be a little bit harder or a little bit more boring to have all of your characters be from one guild. But you can only tell certain stories if you, you've got this group of characters who are all from different backgrounds and different guilds. Yeah, I, I think it'll be some interesting uh, trying to figure out like how why 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 would Boros and Simic work together, and what scenario would Boros and Simic be opposed to Selesnya? Yeah, I, I could I definitely can imagine some really cool scenarios that justify different guilds being in conflict or allying with each other. I'm also really excited to one day make a character whose motivation and goals in life is purely to trade as many frog lizards as possible. Purely to one day become a human ooze. <laughs> yeah, I, Simic, the nice thing that I think, the nice thing about the Ravnica guilds is that the allied color pairs and kind of the allied guilds combine nicely. You could see why the Orzov and the Demir would get along. One is a corrupt kind of religious organization. One of them does assassinations and spying. They're synergistic there. You know, the Azorius, they are all about law-keeping. And the Boros are all about military law-keeping. So they are, they're buddies. So you get all these nice little pairings where there's room for storytelling that would naturally weave these characters together. And also, natural conflicts. The Rakdos, who like killing people for fun... They party too hard, and the Azorius, they hate when you party. They hate it so much. It, it de- I think it will definitely be really interesting to see something like, in one setting, the Orzov and the Azorius working together on something, and then in another setting, seeing the Azorius and the Boros working together on something. I, I think there, there will be a lot of times where you can see just very different sides of the different guilds, and how different influences can kind of just shift how they work and how they operate. So we don't know much about what's actually in the book, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, but one thing that we do know that the developers have told us is that there's going to be text in the, in the book about if you're playing in this guild, um, what common classes would show up here not like you know not like rules but like you know suggestions like if you're in this guild here's what kind of race or class you might be you might commonly see but also it says if you're the dm making a campaign if your players are in this guild or in these collection of guilds what might their motivations be and also for all the other guilds how could they become adversarial? So a lot of this is going to be provided by Wizards authors. How how could Selesnya become adversarial? How could Azorius become adversarial? How could, uh, what's another good one? How could like the Izzet just start trying to dominate the world? You know, well, the, they're mad scientists. It's what they do. Yeah, yeah. How, how, could, how could the Golgari try to just be... Uh, big beetling up in the world. I just want to know how many of the Selesny ones are. This person disrespected a tree. One one bone broken for every twig snapped? Yes. Fair. Fair. One sapperling planted for every twig snapped. Now, <laughs> <laughs> um, given that this is so cool, right, we, we have a great setting for... Well, I have a question about yeah. the guilds. Yeah, so yeah. Which guild do you guys align with? Oof. Which one do you most identify with? Um, I'll, I'll. You have to pick one true answer, and I'll let you weasel in a second one. All right, I'll do a true answer, and then I'll weasel in one more. Uh, true answer is Boros. I feel like of the characters that I've played the most in D anD D, I have enjoyed like a Boros type character the most. And your weasel answer was? Uh, let's do weasel answer later. Okay, Devin? Um, I think it's probably... Hmm. I feel like it's probably Azorius, but my weasel answer has got to be Izzet. 
I think my weasel answer, like if I had to kind of squeak in one more, that would be good. It might be, um, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to say where like a monk would go. Um, I'm actually probably going to say gruel. I think they probably fit monk the best. They get shamans. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, none of the guilds really have monks. Maybe yeah, Celestia yeah. might have a monk. True. Yeah, I actually think I think Celestia is might monk. be the most monkey. I think so. Mm-hmm. It's definitely something green. Yeah. It's either it's either it's either green, white, or green, red. It, it's it's really just like it's really Naya. I think monk seems pretty Naya or pretty Bant to me. It's, it. I mean, but that's the, we're breaking out of Ravnica most... now. Yeah, the the group with the most monks is definitely, um, oh, the Jess guy. Jess guy have the most. Oh monks yeah, and that's white, red, blue. But different set. I different would say set. for me, it's probably is it with a bullet. Um, and then if I'm honest about my personality, it's probably Slesnia, and that pisses me off because I hate those fucking idiots. I hate I feel playing like, as them. I hate. I feel like. As a D&D character, you would definitely be is it first, but I honestly think you'd be like you'd probably be 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 Rakdos second. Oh yeah, Rakdos is definitely like the things I would play as, it's definitely is it then Rakdos, but if I was going with who I am as a person, I'm probably Slesnia and then is it and that upsets me deeply because oh, I who I am as a as Slesnia. Yeah. Who I am as a person is probably rank 1 Boros, rank 2 Azorius. But my D and D characters that I have enjoyed the most have been rank one Boros, rank two Gruel. I think I care about other people too much to be is it first. They really don't care about other people. They they care about them if they can turn them into insect people. No, that's the Simic. They care about turning them into insect, uh-huh. insect people. Oh, true. Is yeah, it I like was blowing them up by accident. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, another question. Which of the weird Ravnica races would you like to see added to D&D? Whew. Um, so whatever. there are some races that only really show up in Ravnica. I think weirds got to get in there. Yeah, that's with a bullet. Weirds. <laughs> weirds Weirds actually already exist in D&D. What? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Are they well, combinations sorry. of opposing elements like they They're, are in Ravnica? Uh, no, they are one element specific, but I would love to see multicolor weirds in uh, in D anD. I would love to see multi element weirds. Now there there sort of kind of are because all of them there's like there's like eight different methods. Methods are like little elemental imps, and they all have the the ability to embody like mul- like more than one element there's like a mud one and like an ice one that are like you know this is like this is like wind and water and this is like you know this is this is earth and water this is fire and wind cuz you know if you're like if you're like charcoal or ash you're kind of typically thought of as fire and wind yeah but um, the weird the nice thing about weirds is that they are by definition made up of two opposing forces like yeah. there's ste- bliss i think steam core weird bliss, it's, it's called water- blister coil weird yeah, it's water full of steam and heat. There's uh, frost burn that turns from ice to fire. Like they're all fun. Gelectrode. Mm-hmm. Everyone loves Gelectrode. Yeah, those are definitely weird and weird. Human ooze. Human ooze is good. I would like to see human ooze. I would like to see frog lizard. <laughs> so I think one of the things that we've been, I guess, well, Flame let me say like this. We've been saying a bunch of cool, exciting things about this Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. I have a question for you all, because you would know this better than I would, about what I perceive to be a potential challenge to doing this. So the setting that they're choosing within Ravnica is, I think, what they call the 10th District. It's where all the guilds sort of touch a little bit. Um, I forget who doesn't have a district. Is it the Golgari? Are they under? Are they just the sewers? I think no, it's the Gruul. I thought who, it was the Demir, because who, the Demir claimed to not have a place. Oh, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty hard with the Demir. I was I thinking know. the, the Gruul's land, from my understanding, in, like, MTG lore, is, like, just steadily decreasing with every day. Yeah, they destroy things. They're a little I rough. think it's because the they, I think, 
the gruel were more like I think in Ravnica my understanding of it is that Ravnica didn't always used to be just one world city like that happened at some point and the gruel were more important prior to when literally everything was a city Mm -hmm. and so this is one of the major questions right Um, Devin you know this because when you played in my campaign you were a druid but in the realm of D&D in general, there's three places you can get your magic or your abilities from, right? <clears throat> you can get your magic from the arcane, which is strictly like wizard-type magic, intelligence-based wizard magic, all right? We get that in both magic and D&D. That's fine. Uh, we get the divine, which is faith-based magic, which we get both in D&D and in Magic the Gathering. And the other one that uh, we see in D&D is the natural magics. And those are uh, typically wisdom-based, nature-based, um, coming from the earth and the forest and the mountains and things like that. Well, if we're in an entirely cityscaped plane of existence, will this hinder things like the ranger, the druid, the barbarian that have these very like earthy natural magic mechanics? Because Natural magic, like natural elements, don't really exist in Ravnica. Everything's a city. Well, that's what the Gruul and the Demir and the Golgari are all about, and the Slesnia, all the, mm-hmm. all the ones that have green in them, basically. Except Simic. Uh, well, Simic, Simic occasionally will dabble with that shit, but it, it's got to have science in there too. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're moving this water with science, but you know, we're moving water, so it's kind of. It's kind of crazy. I, I, I definitely can imagine the, um, especially the Golgari. I, I feel like there would be a very interesting Golgari druid, like a death death right shaman druid. DRS. I a hundred percent know someone is going to jump into this thing and be like, "I want to be death right shaman." I'm very cheap but very powerful. <clears throat> yeah. I am kind of broken. Well, he's um, banned in all formats, so. There are Is going. Is he banned in vintage? They banned. Oh no, he's banned in legacy and modern. There are, um, like as you know, remember as you guys mentioned that the planeswalkers would be really, really good to have in a setting like like D anD. d In the last, you know, couple sets of Return to Ravnica, there were the people that were the Maze Runners. Um, the I forget what they were called. The um, your like champion of the guild or whatever, and it was like Lavinia of the Tenth and. Um, uh, what's the Boros guy's name? Um, fuck, I forgot the name of him. Um, but there were like a bunch of named characters in Ravnica um, that were not necessarily planeswalkers. Uh, Lavinia, Tajik, um, Rorik. Um, Malik. Yeah, Malik. Like, there were a bunch of people that had these, like, cool named characters. And they could also show up in our game. But one of the things that I was curious about was how are, you know, how is, like, how is the ranger and the, and the, uh, druid and the, um, you know, barbarian, how are they going to fit into the world? I guess they do. Because if we look at the maze runners, there's, a maze runner that kind of is a ranger, a barbarian, a druid. Like, they kind of already exist. Yeah, they they managed to make it work because each of the guilds has some elements of that. Like, I could name cards that are rangers or druids or barbarians. Like, the Gruul are almost nothing but druids and rangers and barbarians. Yeah. <laughs> now, you might only get them in one group, and same thing, like, I don't think there's going to be a ton of rogues outside of Demir, the rogue guild. They had yeah, rogue I... tribal at one point. <laughs> like, that's their thing. I could um, see I could see rogue going in um, Rakdos as well. I could see rogue going in Orzov, but I'm pretty sure rogue has to be black something. You gotta yeah, be a, a rogue ghost being Orzov. Yeah. I don't think you can be stealthy if you're Rakdos. I let me if you're no, Rakdos but you and can you have play sneak stealthy, attack. You're doing it wrong. True. You're doing it wrong. Actually, yeah, you're right. They stab you in the front, <laughs> and then you blow up somehow. So I, I'm looking forward to this. I might actually try this because D and D has not really been my thing, but 
a setting I'm familiar with and stories that I've – I mean, I've been playing with Ravnica cards since I was a child. So at this point, this is one of kind of the foundational mind spaces in my life. So I would like to see it and see how they adapt it. And I want to cast Putrefy. Is that so wrong? <laughs> I want to electrolyze someone. You wanna you wanna be able to museum mortars somebody. I want to invoke the fire mind on some people. That was gonna be my 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 last question of the show, which was based on where both of you are right now, uh, Devin. You know, I I know you played a little more D and D because you were in my campaign for a while. Um, Gina, you've done a, a little bit less of the sort of pencil and paper RPG stuff. Is the setting of Ravnica mixed together with D&D, is that going to be more inclusive? Do you think it's going to catch more minds and more people's attention? Or do you think something like this is a little bit too flavorful, too, I guess, like, I don't want to say nostalgic, but, like, is there too much here already that it could throw off some new players? Like, would people not want to get into this because it's already too big? I think um, this is a case where it probably is best to have either a group that's mostly all familiar with magic or a group that no one is really that familiar with magic or mostly unfamiliar. I, th- I think it would just be a lot easier if you had something like that. Right. Yeah, I would say that this is more of a niche product. Like you're not going to – you would not introduce this as the first D&D experience if someone doesn't have any familiarity with it. I don't think it's going to have the breadth of a regular D&D experience. But for that subset of people who plays Magic and D&D, it'll be great. And for the people who play Magic who have thought about D&D but have stayed out for some reason, this might be a reason to get into it. So it'll be a good crossover experience. But I don't think that it is – it can't have the same depth. Like D&D can take place in whatever world you want. Like it's just a rule set. You know? I think one of the things that's going to make this easiest for new players who maybe are uncomfortable with this is the fact that the backgrounds give you so much to work with. That's probably going to be the biggest thing for me. Um, some some things that I'm curious about to know when they do release the book, because um, again, it's not going to come out till November, but uh, one of the things that I'm curious about is, are they going to introduce more spells? That's that's one of my big questions. Are they going to introduce more spells? Because that's someone that they don't do that often, but it's been done before where they've introduced a set of new spells. Um, are they going to introduce any new subclasses? And I don't think that's going to happen. They might introduce new um, stat blocks for characters. Like if you want to be a... You know, one of the races that are in um, uh, Ravnica somewhere. Uh, they could put out a couple of stat block suggestions for some uh, Ravnica characters. I don't see how they don't add some spells. Like, Ravnica might have some of the most iconic spells in all of Magic's history. But may I suggest Lightning Helix? Yeah. Perhaps you would like to add Electrolyze, Putrefy, Mortify... Um, what are the other big... Any of the charms, you know, that are just so Ravnica-y. Void Slime. Mm -hmm. Abrupt Decay. Like, there are so many Yeah, Abrupt Decay is played, like, in lots of formats still. Sphinx's Revelation. Supreme (laughs) Verdict. Yeah. Like, it... There are just Electrolyze. Electrolyze again. Electrolyze is a good one. (laughs) Is Electrolyze good? Yes, Electrolyze is played in all formats. Really? It's amazing. Isn't that the one that just does, like, plus one, but it could be all creatures get plus one? No, that that is um, Electricery, and that sees play in Pauper. Uh, Electrify oh. is... Electrolyze. Electrolyze is deal one damage... Uh, deal two damage distributed as you want between two targets, and then draw a card. It's It's, like, potentially a three for one, and it usually is. Huh. Yeah, I think the the only card I, don't know, I think Lightning Helix might see more play actually. Yeah, Lightning Helix definitely sees more play, but Electrify Electrolyze is always in play. Which is oh weird. yeah, that's a first go round Ravnica card. And I'm sure Slesnia has a spell that I'm forgetting. <laughs> 
repopulate. Yeah. Root, Rootborn defenses. That's a card. It's it. Glare of subduel. Oh, that's broken. There's one. The wrecking ball. Rakdos is that's, all. Yeah, Rakdos. Yeah. Showstopper is my. That's a really. It's a bad card, but it's a fun one. The art is is a clown who's like, and I'm done, but he's all blown up. I mean, if there isn't a spell that allows you to rapidly hybridize something, I don't know what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, if you can't turn something into something else that's ooze or frog related, what are we even doing here? Well, right, that's so, about all I got. I'm really right. excited to see what this book has to offer. Um, like I said, the, the the predictions that I'm looking for are: do they add more spells? I'm pretty sure that's going to be a yes. It do better. they add? Yeah. Do they add more classes? Probably not. Yeah, they, um, they've got so many already. Well, sorry, not new classes, um, but like a new subclass. They just did that for Xanathar's Guide to Everything, so they probably won't do it again, even though that they know that there is kind of like an artificer that I think is coming out in a book soon, and like they kind of need to do some work on the ranger and the monk because there's some subclasses that are kind of lacking there. Um, But I think they specifically announced that they weren't going to be in these sets. And then um, I'm just curious to see how much... um, how much they do for the players and for the DMs in this book. Because it's not really going to be a module. Like, the story is there already. Like, if you play Curse of Strahd or Storm's King Thunder, Storm King Thunder, like, the story is in the book. You just you do what the story says, and you're kind of good. This seems different. seems like it's going to be the mix, like, the perfect mix between pre-established story and freedom of the DM to make their own campaign. And that's what's exciting me the most about this, not just the fact that it's magic plus... D&D, but the fact that it's, like, tons of help and, like, still freedom for the DM. Yep. So, I'm looking forward to it. And maybe we'll get a game in when this is uh, when this is all out. So, um, if you want to te- get in touch with the show, you can do so at DeepListensPod on Twitter, DeepListens.Libsyn.com. We've got comment sections. They seem to be buggy right now. I need to figure out what the heck's going on. But maybe <laughs> maybe those comments are working again. Uh, and deep listens podcast at gmail.com. You can send in feedback. You can also hit up uh, YouTube. Just type in deep listens, and I'm, you'll probably end up with our podcast and not some sort of horrible deep dive in YouTube. Probably. Um, thank you, Billy. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'm, I'm pretty happy about this book. Um, I'm certainly going to rant about it when it comes out in November. Thank you, Devin. Yeah, it's good to be back. I haven't been on for a while, and it's good to talk with you guys again. Great. And thank you, listeners. Till next time, peace.